Welcome to the Garage Gym Experiment podcast, where we dive deep into the home gym scene. Each week, we put out Sunday surveys where you tell us your thoughts on products, builds, and all things home gym related. We're here to break down the numbers at a talk shop. So thanks for listening, and let's get started. Hey, Gavin, thanks for joining today. No problem at all, Jake. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Awesome. Today we have Gavin Laird. So Gavin, would you mind just starting us off with a little background about yourself? As you say, my name is Gavin Laird. I own and operate Gavin Laird Strength, which is a a tiny one-man band design consultancy based in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, I predominantly design and license equipment to uh, brands, mostly in Europe, um, but I also offer consultancy services around that area. Gotcha. And how long have you been involved in strength training and then also just designing on its own? Oof. Strength training, gosh, I started training on my 14th birthday, 1993. My aim at that point was to be the world's strongest man, which I'm sure is a fairly common aim for a 14-year-old boy. And um, my father was kind enough to buy one of these uh, elastic band resistance multi-gyms. I don't know, you're maybe, you're maybe too young to even remember these things, but you had a, a heavy duty elastic band and an oval with uh, two pressed steel centers that slid onto rods to allow you to slide on more or less bands to alter the resistance. And you, okay. know, you could cool down and you could bench press. And um, the deal was that if, uh, if I trained with that every day, he would get me a gym membership the next year. Uh, so I did. And uh, that was the start of my uh, journey in both in, in training and in equipment, because this thing was a piece of shit, you know, and I ended up when I was 14. <laughs> right. So how many years before you decided to design your own stuff? Um, design and equipment came about 2000, 2001, when I opened my first gymnasium. Um, I trained all the way through my teenage years. I played rugby and, you know, lifted weights and so on. Um, moved up to Aberdeen, further north in Scotland from where I was born to go to university, study sports science at university, and eventually left university and opened my first gym, um, results gym in Aberdeen. And it was whilst I was there um, that I started developing equipment and, and uh, hand building pieces. And the reasoning behind that at the time was that I couldn't get what I needed. It was just as simple as that. Um, I was training predominantly strength and conditioning, rugby athletes, powerlifters, you know, decent level guys and gals. And um, I found there was a lot of things that I wanted to be able to accomplish in their coaching that I couldn't because the equipment didn't exist or the setups were too inconvenient and so on and so on. So I started hand fabricating equipment probably 2000, 2001, just to fill those needs. So what did the gym look like? And then what was some of the first things that you did create? Okay. Um, In terms of what it looked like, if you can imagine Westside Barbell, but with a broad Scots accent, um that's essentially what the what, what what the place looked like probably 35 feet by 25 feet industrial building the roof leaked it was damp there was no heating in Aberdeen it regularly gets to 10 degrees below zero in the winter you know that kind of place um in terms of the equipment that we put in actually the first thing that I put into that gym that I built was a very simple bracket with a pulley wheel and uh, that was fixed to the concrete floor with concrete bolts so that we could run the low cable through that to create a belt squat unit in the middle of the power rack. Now I see companies dropping that product now. Interesting. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, sorry guys. Uh, we had the rack mounted belt squat in crappy little Scotland in uh, 2001. Um, and stuff like that, really just filling gaps in our training with, uh, with things that we couldn't obtain. We had a very, very early version of an assisted Nordic curl machine as well. That's a machine I commercially licensed now. A um, couple other bits and bobs of sort of core training equipment uh, based around rotational movement to standing position because at the time that was something that was just not really commercially available. Um, so it's that, that kind of thing, just sort of focused strength and conditioning tools that were either available in the United States but were not available in the United Kingdom at that time or hadn't really come to the market at all yet. And I was just scratching my head and sort of thinking, well, crap, we've got this problem. How are we going to fix it? You know, um, and that, that's where all of my stuff really comes from. It's just from coaching background and working with athletes, coming up against a problem and going, how are we going to solve that? Um, and being willing to then go and cut and weld metal until the problem solved. You know, that's <laughs> the gist of it. When did you first get involved with designing for others? Oh, uh, 2015. So quite a long, long time uh-huh. later, I'd subsequently moved even further north to uh, Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and uh, I started running Forge Gym there in 2009, 2010. Basically the same gym all over, but five times as big. And as usual, when you try and take the hardcore into the commercial environment, it falls in its arse. But we had fun for a decade. <laughs> and um, that was all right. You know, it was all right. 
Um, so mid mid midway through that, around about 2015, I did uh, a couple of designs that I took down to SFN, which was the the National Fitness Exposition um, in Scotland, and I, I rented a little stall and I took these two uh, pieces down to that gym um, display area, and uh, we had numerous people, you know, come around and show a bit of an interest. And I guess that was the birth of it as a commercial enterprise. And I didn't really know what I was, where I was going with it. I just knew that I had these two pieces that I had designed. And I thought, well, Christ, you know, if someone's got CDs, I was smart enough to realize that manufacturing them myself was not the way to go. Um, I really don't see that as being a viable way of conducting my business um, because I know that the way that my brain is wired, the first time I make something, it's fun. The second time, it's a little bit dull. And if I have to make it three times, I'm already bored and I want to throw it in the trash. <laughs> gotcha. <clears throat> so for me, all of the interest is in the creation of the cash. And after that, I have no interest in running the business. I have no interest whatsoever in any of the other stuff. I just want to get it over the line. Uh-huh. So you've been, you've been really designing for others for like seven, eight years or so now. Can you give a rundown of some of your, maybe just your favorite ones that you've designed? Personal favorites. It's, it's a tough one because, I mean, on a, on a cynical basis, the... The ones that are my favorites are the ones that pay the mortgage, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, and that, that, would, that would be generics, you know? So I did a folding flat incline decline bench um, for, a, for a company here in Europe. Now that folds completely flat. It can be stored in its flat profile, you know, like under a bed or whatever. It can also be stored vertically on a holding pin out to the front. Um, it's fully adjustable FID. It's a nice piece of kit, but it's just a bench at the end of the day. You know, um, but to date they've sold over a thousand units of that bench. Yeah, uh, um, in the UK, when it's a relatively small market here, so that's pretty good numbers. Um, so it's things like that, yeah, that was nice. Um, every now and again, you get a license check through for that one, and we all go out for pizza. You know, right? So <laughs> that's definitely one of my favourites. Although in terms of design and innovation and everything, it's a lovely piece. I'm really proud of it, but there's nothing in it that you look at and go, oh my God, you know, I've never seen that before. That's so exciting. No, it's just a really well put together bench. Yeah. Um, on the more interesting sort of side of things, I guess would be the uh, jammer arms that I did for Primal Strength uh, here in the UK. Uh, they started development in probably 2016 was the first time I started playing around with jammer arm concept. Um, they really languished for a long time. Nobody was interested. They didn't click for some reason. Um, and then later on in 2019, it did. Uh, Primal approached me and said, yeah, we would, we would love to manufacture this. Let's get it up to a commercial level and, uh, and get going with it. Um, and at that time, that was the, that was the first jam arm that you could uh, set the starting angle of the arm relative to the rack. So it had an indexing position to hold it out so you could have it you know, parallel with the rack, 90 degrees to it, whatever you wanted. It also converged and diverged um, with a locking and unlocking mechanism. So you could choose whether the arms would track inwards towards each other, outwards or not track at all. And a slide rail mechanism to position the height. So you didn't have to take it off of the rack um, to adjust the height. And at that time, that was pretty revolutionary. Um, I think there was one out there that was sliding up and down on the trolley system. And uh, VA7 in Germany had a, a version of the converging arm. But to, to have it set at the different angles was really the whole point of my uh, one that I roughly prototyped in 2016, because that was my frustration with lever arms that were available in the market, was that the athlete always had to start with the arm hanging on the ground, you know, or hanging pointing down towards the floor. And that really, that really limited its usefulness to me as a coach, you know? So that one was nice. Um, I think we're on the third version thereof, and we're developing the fourth just now. Um, so I can't talk about it, but it's really cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. For like those lever arms, I'd be really curious to hear, you mentioned you started design back in 2016. It took a few years for somebody to pick them up. Yep. So how long though, did it yep. take you to like specifically design them? Did it take years to design or was it something that you just kind of, the big issue was no. creating or getting people to buy in? Buy-in was the problem. Uh, and, and I think with that particular pro product, it was recognition of the existence of the market, specifically the market that, you know, that you have a very real interest in. Right. Um, I think that there, there, there's not a blindness to the home gym equipment market, but sometimes I feel like larger companies will look at the things that are there and go, well, you know, that's not really suitable for the commercial gym market that we supply um, in multiple use things that involve a bit of setup time and a bit of adjustability. They're not suitable for commercial gyms because 
you know, uh, Joe and Jane Harry need to be able to come in and sit down and push and pull the lever and it just works. Um, so a product such as a jammer arm, uh, it takes a company that has an interest in supplying home, garage, gym, small studio space markets. Um, and it just took that time of going around houses and knocking on doors and having conversations before that particular product clicked with a, a brand that was interested in supplying that market. And that was, um, that was primal strength here in the UK. The design, I probably had that sketched out in 40 minutes. And I'd say probably three days later with the welder, we had a functioning prototype. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and then thereafter, it became smaller and lighter and smaller and lighter and smaller and lighter as iterations went on um, until we kind of got to an end point where it was like, right, I can't make this any smaller. I can't make this any easier to use. That's as commercial as it's ever going to be. Let's go to production. Makes sense. Something that not a lot of people are clear on, and myself as well, is like, what happens with the pat? Like, I'm guessing you had a patent for those adjusting kits, lever arms. Design patent. Yeah. Got it. And then how does that like protect you from people in other countries? Not at uh, all. Not at all. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Uh, yeah, I'd be... You have probably 10 companies now that are offering it in the United States. Right. Yeah. I've definitely seen the product a few times already. I guess I, I would love to just yeah. know, like, no. how does that make you feel? And then also, like, what would be the best reaction of a company who says, I do appreciate this product. I want to sell it in this country. What would you be looking for, I guess? Not saying it's going to happen. Well, it depend, it de yeah, it depend, depends on, the, the, on what circumstance you're asking the question from. From the shareholder's perspective, the answer is that you should rip off the designer, get the product manufactured as cheaply as possible, and get it out the door, right? Um, from the perspective of a designer, my ideal situation is they would contact me and say, look, legally speaking, we could give you the rough ride over this, but we'd like to acknowledge that, you know, this concept is yours, this idea was yours, we would love to work with you on creating something along the same lines or changing it slightly for our market, or even just let's get out the door and here's a little percentage. You know, uh, I'd be very happy to license IP um, to, to, to anyone who worked in that way. Uh, it's essentially the most of my business. Um, but I also completely understand that this is a business and the people that operate in it are not there to give cuddles to little designers working away in their cottage industries. They are there to make fantastical amounts of money for themselves and their shareholders. And, you know, I think if you approach it with the impression that you're going to get a cuddle off of somebody, um, you come away in tears from this industry every day of your working life. Uh, whereas if you just accept that this is a part of it, you know, um, you will design things, they will be ripped off, they'll be copied, they'll be put out without any acknowledgement. And that's just how it is. That's fine. And on the flip side, if I see an innovative product in another market that doesn't have patent protection in the European market, I would sell it too. Right. What choice do I have? Yeah, you know, and that's, that's the brutal nature of it, but it's the absolute truth. So I see a lot of guys really get their ants, you know, really, really get uptight about this kind of stuff. And I try very, very hard not to, um, because whether I like it or not is irrelevant. It is the situation as it is. And if you choose to be in this industry and designing products, then you have to accept that and get on with it. Um, there is no changing it. Really cool insights there. Okay, awesome. All right, you mentioned the bench, the lever arms, any other products that you're really proud of? In a, in a similar vein, some of the stuff that from a design perspective I'm proudest of is actually we're being approached on a consultancy basis um, which means everything's NDA'd up the wazoo. We can't name the company. We can't name the products. We can't name anything. But some of the things that, from a design perspective, the most challenging are when a company approaches me and says, there is this product on the market. <laughs> it is selling very well. It is patent protected. Here are the utility patents. Here are the design patents. We need a product that does the same thing and escapes those patents. Uh, and, and from a design perspective, that is the challenge. You know, that is, that is, that is uh, almost as fulfilling as creating something from scratch. Uh, because now you have a set of parameters that you cannot touch on, but an outcome that you must accomplish. And that, that can be extremely tight sometimes. Uh, it can be very, very low in the variables that you can actually mess around with. Um, and I enjoy that work. I enjoy that kind of puzzle. So I guess I'm on both sides of the fence there. You know, when you say, how do I feel about you know, patent exploitation outside of my territory. Well, yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but equally, yeah, absolutely. I'll put my hand up. I make money by people coming to me and saying, we want to release this product and we can't because of a patent. How can we design around it? Got it. Do you have any failed products you could talk to oh, us yeah. about? Or yeah, yeah like- how, how many? How many do you want to hear? Uh, <laughs> uh, or like what percentage um, of the designs that you create actually work? 
I guess, again, it comes to your criteria of what, what's working. You know, do they function? Do they fulfill the object? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thereafter, you're going to lose a certain percentage just due to commercial viability. Can it be built for a price that it can be sold for? You know, so we lose a percentage on that. Coming down again, is there a big enough market to justify the tooling cost? So if I have to set up a mold or whatever where the manufacturer has to, you know, create some specific shape in polyurethane, there's a cost to that. If they can't sell 5,000 units, it's not worth making the mold. And I sell 5,000 of it. You know, just as an example. And, and, and so on and so on. So as we come down that line of um, potential issues with product viability, we lose more and more product. So I would say probably 20% of everything I've drawn is on the market. And that leaves uh, a really quite tremendous amount of things not on the market. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, do you have any specific <laughs> ones that you could tell us about or that you really, really wanted to work but didn't? Um, yeah, sure, sure. Um, at one point, I designed a product that used um, an anti-backlash 17 to 1 gear ratio gearbox and a drive handle and a little split pin mechanism on the other side. And essentially what it let you do was to take a resistance band that we were using for accommodating resistance in squats or deadlifts or whatever. You would turn the gears to the handle on one side, it went tension onto the band. It would not backlash under the band tension because the gearbox anti-backlash mechanism stopped it from doing so. And the gradient of the band tension was measured against rotation of the disc. So you could incrementally specifically increase the exact amount of tension that you wish to place on the band. Because you were never pulling the band off or on or onto something under tension, you removed the possibility of trapping your fingers in the band or it's snapping back against your personal parts or uh -huh. any of these things that we've all done. You know, any uh -huh. who uses accommodating resistance has a nightmare story about a band, right? Um, so this would basically let you fix the band on at one end to this device, put the slack band over the, uh, the end of the barbell or whatever it was you were applying the accommodating resistance to and tension it by winding a anti backlash handle. Now that was rack mountable, fitted in any, any rack with a one inch hole, just clipped around it, nice and simple and steady. Um, we made a single prototype. Um, the machining, I remember the CNC machining cost me 600 quid GBP for the prototype. So that's probably about $850. <laughs> Um, and I made it knowing full well that it would never be commercially viable. But once it had the idea, I couldn't let it go and I needed it to exist. Um, so it does now exist and it languishes in a dusty corner and, uh, and that's it. So I guess that would be an example of a product that had almost zero market, maybe, you know, like a thousand powerlifters worldwide using enough band tension. They're like, oh, gee, I really don't want to have to pull 600 pounds of band tension up on my max effort squat. I'd much rather just turn a handle. You know, that, that, right. sounds, that sounds a lot safer and nicer. Right. That's a tiny market. You know, and then the machining costs were extortionate because the whole thing was machined out of a billet piece of stainless steel. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it just uh, it goes on like that. So that, that's an example of a product that went absolutely nowhere. I never had a hope of going anywhere in the first place, but it was something of a little obsession with mine because once it came into my brain, I thought, you know, this really does solve the problem. And I would like to say that we solved the problem. Yeah, that would be really cool. Do you remember how much time you spent on that? Um, drawing time, probably three, four working days. I mean, that's quite a um, lot. Yeah. Not a tremendous amount. Again, you, you, it's not no. much. Honestly, it's, 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 it's not. It's not. When you think about the life cycle of a product, you know, that you, you could have a product in the market for a decade. You know, um, so have to, to, to spend a, to spend three or four working days on a product is, is very, very low. And when you think about the design of product um, in our industry, but at the very mass market and large scale company level, um, you know, think about how many man hours the Cybex put into the new leg press oh, in total. Yeah, you know, you, you have a team of design guys, you have a team of safety spec guys and on and on and on and on and on. It's probably thousands of hours. So for me to look at a product and go, well, yeah, we rattled out 25 hours. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very very little, um, and I'm not uh, I'm not too careful about my time. I'm quite happy to waste three or four days on something that I know will never sell because of the enjoyment that I get out of it, and that's really quite important to me. Is that uh, I do that first, satisfy me first, um, and then if someone else is interested in the product and it's commercially viable, well, hey, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm I'm overjoyed with that. But when it's my own stuff, it comes from me first. Um, it's exactly the opposite of the situation where someone comes to me saying, we need a product to do this and that and the other, and it's a puzzle to solve. Well, then their requirements are, are first and foremost, and what I think is an irrelevance. Um, but it's possible to hold those two concepts in your, in your mind at different times when they're applicable to different, uh, different products. But yeah, a few days to draw that, got it machined locally, had to custom order the gearbox and all, the, all these bits. Um, so yeah, I'd probably say like a fortnight, probably two weeks of having it in existence at all, you know, from, from the idea to having something that you could 
actually stick a band on and make a little video and put it up on Instagram and have a few powerlifters go, it's uh-huh. awesome. And everybody else go, huh? <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd be curious to hear how much of your time is spent on your own ideas or some sort of consulting job with another company. Uh, I prefer to spend the vast majority of my time doing my things that I want to do. Consultancy type works probably like 20% of my total time. Um, There's a lot of crossover there because with several companies that I've offered uh, licensed designs for, you know, so they're out there on a royalties type basis now, they get sold, I get a small percentage of. Almost inevitably, those companies will then come back with other products and with other queries and problems, manufacturing issues, sourcing issues, whatever it might be. And, oh, Gav, could you give me a hand with that? Is there something you can do for us here? And I'll always say yes, and I'll always do that. You know, But the majority of those people do have that license business first. Um, and, and then that tends to make them easier to deal with for me. Consultancy basis stuff, I guess my, my nightmare consultancy client is the one that pops up every now and again that goes... I've got this really good idea and it's like super revolutionary and it's going to be amazing. Can you, can you, can you get it to work? You know, uh, I've got this great idea, but it doesn't work at all. And I don't know why, you know, it's, it's not a great idea. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but we have them from time to time, they pop up, you know, and uh, we do our best to uh, take everybody's emotions out of the project and um, hopefully at the end get to a viable product. Yes. What does a typical consulting job look like? Not everybody wants to be happy. Well, that would be one example. The, I've got this great idea job. Um, that can come to me at any stage of product development. So they might have just a sketch in the back of an envelope. Sometimes I'll even just get a verbal description of what a product needs to do. You know, they'll have this vague concept of, oh, why isn't there a, something that does this, you know? And, Usually the answer is because it's not possible at the price, you know, um, and we'll have a discussion about that and just, you know, maybe go through some <clears throat> patents or whatever. And I can quickly show them that, you know, it's not so much that this idea is novel, it's that this idea isn't commercially viable. Now, that's not to say that it won't be commercially viable at some point because the market changes all the time, production technology changes all the time. And um, I think more importantly, the, the trends change. So there's plenty of products out there that we look at them and go, look, in 1990, when somebody designed this, it was a dead dodo. Now, is it still a dead dodo in 2020 when you think you've had the idea for the first time again? Don't know. Let's have a look at it. You know, see if there's somebody out there who wants to take it to market. Well, a lot of the time, that's the very shortest of all consultancy processes. You know, and somebody gets in touch and says, I've had this idea. And we go into the patents and go, well, sadly, so did this guy. Um, and it didn't get made and it never made him any money. And he lives in poverty in a little shack, you know. Um, so there's those uh, the next one would kind of come into the broad bracket of we made this product and it doesn't work that's relatively common um, that a product will come all the way through to production or pre-production and then someone will suddenly realize that no it doesn't actually do quite what they intended it to do or it doesn't function in the way that they need it to or it doesn't have the durability that they need it to it's in some way lacking um, and at that point usually out of panic they will start looking for external design input. And sometimes I'll, I'll get that call or email through that says like, we need to get this over the line. We've already pre-sold, you know, a number of units. We've told everybody it was going to change the world. And now it turns out it doesn't work. Uh, can you fix it? Um, so it's that one. And the other two would be designing around patents, as we discussed earlier, and also challenging patents. Um, so I'm not a patent attorney. I'm not trained in that way at all, but I have shot down in flames a number of products that have come out that would have had a detrimental commercial effect for my customer. So part and parcel, as I said earlier, is a very vicious business. Um, and I think a lot of the time the end buyer's understanding of those kind of issues is quite limited. So they see it in a sort of a natural justice kind of viewpoint that, you know, it's just, that's not fair or that's not right. Um, but obviously the systems, they vary in different countries around the world, but essentially the law is the law and what's naturally seems just is uh, something of an irrelevance. So that is pretty common to get asked to do something in that, in that sphere, you know, to, to, to work around the legality of it and uh, let somebody else make some money before the patent expires. Yeah. Okay. I want to ask your opinion on the future, but what about, any big changes you've seen? So you've been designing for like 20 years years. now, and then you've really been consulting and and designing for others for last seven, eight years, like we discussed. Has there been any real big changes that you've noticed within the last 20 years or even more recently, the last five years or so? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the two technologies that have sort of come of age during my time have been inertia flywheel resistance, 
and um, motor electronic sensor controlled motor resistance. Uh, motor resistance kind of popped up a few times during my lifetime and it was always clumsy. The, the technology to regulate it really wasn't good enough um, and the machines invariably felt like shit as a result. Yeah, you know, and there was no getting away from that. Now, that's a thing of the past. You know, we have a couple of hundred pounds resistance on a cable column from multiple companies using some variation of, uh, of, a, of a high torque speed magnetic motor. And um, I see that becoming more and more and more common as time goes on. And I think the kinetic flywheel tech is great if you know how to use it and you can be bothered with the lag time of, you know, those initial repetitions aren't a full force. And, you know, just having an understanding of how it works and accepting that those are the limitations of it, it then becomes really quite interesting in terms of home and uh, small gym use simply because of the lightweight, the compact nature of it, the ability to apply resistance pretty much from any direction where you can mount a unit. Um, so I see those things as being the two major changes. And I'd say in future, I think we're just going to be moving towards more and more motorized resistance. Um, that's definitely the direction I see it moving in. And I think as the sensor technology not so much catches up, but really just starts to be applied to the fitness industry, because a lot of this tech already exists elsewhere. It just needs to come over into fitness. You, you're going to see a lot more of this kind of design where you have uh, you know, a black oblong box on the wall about two inches deep and you're looking at it and going, well, what's that? And what's my entire gym? You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's, uh, right. that's the direction that we're probably going to move in through to, I don't know, probably 20, 30 or so, I think. And, and it'll just be a case of price point coming down and the technology becoming better and more and more prevalent. Um, and then once we've had a full generation of guys that grew up with uh, resistance motor home gym tech, there'll be a barbell backlash. You know, and, and these guys will uh, pop up harking back to the true ways and, and trying to convince everyone that the barbell is the best again, you know? Yeah, I'm sure they'll they'll definitely always be that sort of resistance. I think even from people that do it now. So interesting that you said 2030. I'd be curious to know, like, who do you think's doing it best right now, if you have that opinion? Um, okay, well, you've got Nordic Track, you've got Vitruvian, um, who's the other guys? iFit. Maybe the, yeah, um, they're all making product that kind of works. Um, I'm not sure, having not used them in person, which one I would say would be the, the better of them, but they're all very similar ideas. The main limitation that everybody's got right now is that on like a cable more resisted platform, you're looking around about 200 pound resistance per cable. Is a, That's about the, the top that we can do right now. Um, as that gets higher, I think the, the, it'll be more and more applicable. But 200 pounds is quite reasonable for... Uh, a loading in each hand for a generic fitness enthusiast working in their bedroom in a very small space. You know, it's it's not terrible limitation, but for a more advanced athlete or a person with a, a definite interest in strength training, it's a bit of a joke. You know, I've got two sandals and I can only deadlift 400 pounds on it. What am I going to do? You know, <laughs> but we tend to forget the strength focused people that there's a massive, massive market out there of people who have no interest whatsoever in deadlifting 400 pounds, 400 kilos. So they just, you know, they want to, they want to look a bit better. They want to feel a bit better. They want to train regularly and they don't want it to take up an entire room in their house. And they don't want to need 19,000 different devices in order to perform different movements. You know, so whilst we tend to scoff at that kind of stuff and go, oh, what's the point? I've only got 200 pounds resistance, you know? 95% of the populace that exercises only needs 200 pounds resistance. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any predictions as to like how the next five years are going to play out in terms of technology? Is it going to be a struggle or is it going to like be a slow adoption that you think most of the population will just agree upon? Uh, yeah, I think it'll be the usual kind of creep. Yeah, you know, there's always a vanguard in anything and they're always slaughtered by the people who are still doing yeah you know whatever the, the the most commonly accepted way of doing anything is at that point in time um that you know thus it always has been um so i think right now that's the stage that we're at is that we have a new technology we have a few adopters at the vanguard of it and we have the vast majority of people sitting back and going you know what i'm going to wait until this is 600 pounds <laughs> you know um or, you know, you can prize my barbell out of my cold, dead hand because I'm living in the Stone Age. Uh, you know, I accept that people have that mentality about uh, any new tech, but I think that's what's going to happen. It will be a slow creep towards that. And once we reach that point where sensor tech and the motors can be incorporated into the devices cheaply enough that they can come out in the uh, Christmas fitness market, you know, um, that's when you're actually going to see the real adoption of that tech is when it gets down to that price point that someone can look at it and go, you know what, it's it's not cheap, but yeah, I can do this. 
Whereas right now at this multiple thousand dollar kind of price point, mm -hmm. uh, you really have to be committed to training and know that you're going to use this damn thing. Um, and you really have to have faith in the uh, tech platform that's behind it before you're going to be willing to do that. But as the price point comes down and it becomes less of, an, of a, a risk investment, um, I think that it'll be everywhere. I could be entirely wrong, but that's uh, right. <laughs> so my impression of it, you know, is that we're moving, we're moving away from gravitational based resistance and, and moving towards other means of applying the resistance. Gotcha. gotcha. All right. Well, that's all I've got. Was there anything else you wanted to chat about while you're here? Oh, I think you, you certainly covered questions well enough, Jake. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of specific products and so on, there's there's lots that I can sit there and shout about, but obviously, you know, go, go browse the Instagram, folks. You'll find me. Yeah. Okay. We'll make <laughs> you sure can have to stop there and, and see exactly what it is I do. You know. Yeah, we'll make sure to plug your links for anybody interested in checking out. I'm your... definitely the world's worst self promoter, Jake. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll. I'd love to hear if a company is interested in collaborating with you on something. How do they reach out? Oh, um, the vast majority of them just come through socials. To be honest with you, and I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, I'm one of these on a kind of cross generational age where if someone sends me a formal email or a letter or something, that's great. If someone sends me a DM on Instagram, that's great too. You know, um, I'm really not stuffy about how people get in touch with me. Um, it can be LinkedIn, it can be on the socials, it can be through the website contact form. I don't care. Get in touch. And uh, I tend to be very non formal and straightforward about things. You know, I'm not interested in things being pernickety, shall we say. I just want to have a conversation see what people are, are wanting to do cool well forward cool um sounds good well i'll i'll close this but really appreciate you taking the time to chat definitely got some insights specifically around, around. Just product design and the uh, patent laws with other countries and such that was interesting to learn so yeah thank you and we'll make sure to yeah well if there's any time anyone has any specific questions they can pop them up to you and pass them on to me or, or, or come at me directly. I'm always happy to discuss these kind of things. And um, hopefully in about 20 years time, when all the NDAs expire, I can come back on and name the names and dish the dirt. It'd be a lot more interesting. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love to have you back on. So. <laughs> all right. Thanks, all right. Gavin. Take care, Jake. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time. Cheers.